I tried to save my marriage. To be honest, I did. I grew up in rural Ohio in a family where militant values were as important as going to church every Sunday. Words such as divorce, separation, and infidelity did not exist in our family vocabulary. My parents have been together for over 50 years, and my grandparents have been together for over 70. So when I made my vows, I naturally thought it was forever. I met Daniel in college at a beach party, where I drank too much and threw up on my feet while we were standing around the fire. Don't get me wrong, I was by no means a big drinker, and in fact, it was my lack of experience with alcohol that led me to throw up. But everything happens for a reason, right? I looked at him and vaguely apologized, and although I expected a look of disgust followed by some curse words, he surprised me with a smile and a laugh. Nineteen years and two children later, thinking about that moment always makes me smile. Now this makes me cry. I tried to justify the breakup the only way I knew how. I blame myself. Am I no longer attractive? Was I too boring? Didn't I please him in bed? Didn't I support it? Have I really neglected him? I had too many questions and not enough answers. It was the Sunday when my life as I knew it changed forever. I remember us arguing about taking a vacation, which we hadn't done in years. He promised that when the children grew up, we would travel and see the world together. I was still up for adventure, but according to him, it was something he was no longer interested in. We were in the middle of our debate when he burst out, This marriage isn't working anymore. Those were the infamous words he said to me the day he decided it was all over. It's been four months since we broke up and those words still stick a dagger into my heart. I tried to do better, I really did. I suggested that we do something together, like we did before children. We could go on a date, go away for the weekend, or find a hobby we could do together, but nothing seemed to calm him down. And in a final act of desperation, I begged, please stay for the sake of the children. They need a father. But he shrugged and walked out the door. Don't get me wrong. He's a great dad, a fantastic dad, and I know he'll always be there for them, just not for me. So I've been seeing a therapist for the past month in hopes of helping me put things into perspective. She was fantastic. She said that his behavior is quite common and that in most cases, the husband comes back. He needs time to refocus, recharge, take some time off away from home life, she said. Men are simple. They tend to react rather than assess the situation. Think about it, Karen. He never gave you a reason to worry, never mentioned breaking up, and then suddenly said, this marriage isn't working anymore. It sounds too impulsive to be real. She explained. I nodded in surrender and allowed her to continue. Look, Karen, I can't promise he'll come back, but most of the time, they do. In the meantime, use this time to refocus and recharge your batteries. We all need this she suggested. I continued to see her twice a week for the last two months. She gave me tips on how to talk to my children, stay positive, and even more death-defying how to approach the topic with my parents. But the best advertisement Ice gave me was when she said, Karen, you need to think about how to make yourself feel better. A little self-improvement will restore your self-esteem and confidence. Over the next few weeks, I developed the habit of going to the gym and eating healthier. Gradually, I felt good again. Every day after work, I spent two hours in the gym. I try to mix up my daily routine between cardio, strength training, elliptical, yoga, and aerobics. I felt like I was 30 again, full of energy, full of life. Working out made me feel good physically, and the hungry looks from men made me feel good mentally. I've never had problems with weight. In fact, since I started working out, I don't even think I've lost a pound but I became more fit and had a lot more energy. I'm not glamorous and will never be on the cover of magazines. I'm what they call a small package. I'm 5'4", tall, with long brown hair just below my shoulders, brown eyes and a newly formed, relatively toned body. Most men would consider me cute rather than beautiful, but I have been called both. My secret is pretty simple. I let the gym take care of my body and a little hair color and makeup does the rest. And at 43, I can still raise a few eyebrows. It didn't take long for my children and colleagues to notice the difference in me. Who can blame them? It was just a couple of months ago when I was walking around the office feeling like a broken heart. 
Luckily, my kids were understanding and simply called me Zombie Mommy. But over time, things changed, and I was able to use what I learned in therapy to portray myself as a more confident shell of a person. Yes, just a shell, because deep down I was still scared, insecure, and vulnerable. Two weeks ago, my boss sent me to my annual sales seminar in Chicago. I didn't want to go, but I had no choice. Now I had a routine and I loved it. Besides, the last thing I want is to find myself at some boring sales seminar surrounded by a flock of sheep handing out business cards with a fat handshake. But as I said, I had no choice. Every year, 500 mid-sized businesses were invited to send one representative, and this year it was my turn. Oh, lucky me. It was a three-day event, and each day was filled with numerous sales training sessions that you can attend. One of them was called How to Promote Yourself, Effective Communication, Maintaining Motivation, and Simply Selling Yourself. I attended this seminar five years ago. The classes were lame, boring, and very basic. Not that it mattered, because these classes were just a cover for what this seminar was really about. Chatter. The brochure won't say this, but that's exactly what it says. Meet with representatives of other companies in the hope of selling them your product or exchanging client lists. It is not surprising that every company sends a representative with a plane ticket, an itinerary, and 500 business cards. Typical sales logic, every opportunity is a sales opportunity. Usually when I'm away on business, I always feel comfortable knowing that I can call Daniel during the day. It was nice to know that someone was waiting for my call, that I was not completely alone, that perhaps I was even missing. Even my children are old enough to live their own lives and take care of themselves. Kimberly just turned 18 and Ryan turned 16. Based on my call, I'm just checking on them, and I think they will even answer. In fact, they always told me to write, a sure sign that they don't need to hear my voice. This trip will be more difficult than I thought. I arrived at the hotel at 9 p.m., quickly took a shower, plopped down on the bed and turned on the TV. I was more restless than tired, but more than that, I was hungry. I looked at my watch and it was already about 10 p.m. I remembered there was a tiny mom-and-pop restaurant in the lobby and wondered if they would still be open. There's only one way to find out. I threw on jeans and a sweater and headed to the restaurant. When I got there, all the chairs were on the tables and the staff were definitely in cleaning mode. I turned to leave when I heard the waitress call out to me. Hi, can I help you? She asked. Oh, sorry. I just came in for a bite to eat, but I see that you're closing. The dining room is closed, but the bar is still open. If you want, can you sit there and have a snack from our nightly menu? Of course, that would be great. Okay, follow me, she said, grabbing the menu. I couldn't help but notice how young and pretty the waitress was. I thought she must be in her early twenties. Her body was still firm and toned, and her black yoga pants showed off her curves. She probably works at night and goes to school during the day. I'm sure her body hasn't even seen the gym. Oh, how I wish I could be so young again. She pointed to a seat at the bar and I literally had to jump on it. The waitress smiled at me as if I had just performed a circus act. What a lovely smile she had. This girl was too cute. She handed me the menu and said Dennis would take my order. Having said this, she smiled goodbye and left. I couldn't help but admire her body one last time. To say I was jealous would be an understatement. I sat at the bar, taking in my surroundings. The bar counter was very short, and judging by the number of stools, it could only accommodate four people at a time. Cozy. Being a family-run restaurant, they probably didn't get many bar flies. Sports memorabilia adorned the walls. Framed photos and autographed t-shirts were displayed in place of those tacky neon beer signs. I focused back on the menu, hoping something would spark a craving. Dennis had finally revealed himself. He was in his 60s. His hair was more salt than pepper, and he wore one of those old-fashioned white aprons. He had such a sweet grandfather, and you knew that if given the chance, he would talk your ear off. He probably didn't have many clients, and he really wanted to get his apron dirty. I ordered a glass of red wine with the chicken Caesar salad, and he responded with a hearty, as you wish. 
Ten minutes later, I was already stuffing my face. Dennis kept me company while I ate, talking about his children, grandchildren, and how he met his wife. Family life was a bit of a sore spot for me at the time, but I didn't let that get in the way of his enthusiasm for sharing stories. He was very sweet, charming, and his voice was very soothing, in a way that only happens with age. I was sitting there sipping wine, trying to remember the last time I had a drink, when I heard Dennis a few steps away. What can I get for you, boss? I looked up briefly to see Dennis serving another man at the end of the bar, then looked back at the menu. Are you supposed to be here for the seminar? said the boss. I rolled my eyes, still looking at the menu. The last thing I wanted was to talk at the same time. If you don't know how to do this, you can rest assured, tomorrow I will get my share. So until then, this guy could just have sex. I learned early on never to make eye contact with weirdos unless you want them to haunt you for the rest of the night. Certainly. I, I said to the menu, do you look as excited as I do? You have no idea. I continued to look at the menu. He laughed a little. I should have called the patient. Confused, I asked, what do you mean? At work, the day my company was deciding who to send here. I laughed, and that's when I looked at him for the first time. Who? He was good-looking and not the typical lazy guy you usually see at these seminars. He had a fair oat complexion, clean-shaven, short wavy brown hair, brown eyes with full red lips. He looked my age, but he had a boyish smile that made him look several years younger. I soon found myself lost in his features and immediately returned to my menu. My face turned red. Am I starting to blush? Luckily, Dennis returned, placed his drink in front of him, and took his food order. I tried to hold my gaze, but I couldn't. I wanted to see more, and while he was busy with Dennis, it gave my eyes the perfect distraction. He was wearing a dark blue shirt with gray trousers and a matching jacket, which he draped over the back of his chair. Looking at his black shoes, I thought he must be quite tall, since his feet were comfortably on the floor, while mine dangled at least a foot off the ground. As my eyes moved from his shoes back to his eyes, I found them both looking at me. Caught! I can't believe I just got caught checking him out. They continued to stare at me. What? I asked. I asked if you would like another glass of wine? Dennis answered. Oh, sorry, um, sure. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, I said, poorly hiding my embarrassment. I returned to the menu and promised never to look up again. By the way, my name is Terence, he said, and extended his hand. Hi, my name is Karen. I shook his hand, still avoiding direct eye contact. Dennis put my drink in front of me and excused himself to go into the back room. Just shout if you need anything, he said, and winked at me before walking away. At first I was afraid to be alone with him. I couldn't start conversations with strangers and I didn't know what to say or how to act in such situations. It's funny, being in sales, I was used to meeting new people and promoting a product, but this was different. I was pitching myself and didn't know where to start. I guess that's normal, considering I haven't had much practice in the last 20 years. But Terence made it easy. He took control of the conversation and calmed me down. He kept the conversation light and cheerful, nothing too serious and nothing personal. We mostly laughed at our jobs, our co-workers, our crappy seminar courses, and just about anything else that came into our heads. Throughout our conversation, I subconsciously looked for a pretty waitress who led me to the bar. Has she already left? I kept looking around until I was sure and remembered that she must have gone out for the night. Why should I care if she's still here? By the fourth drink, I was relaxed enough to just be myself. Okay, maybe I was more tipsy than relaxed, but either way, we had fun. I couldn't believe how much fun I was having. My face literally hurt from smiling so much. I honestly don't remember the last time I laughed so much and smiled so often. Damn it, has it really been that long? Sorry, guys, I hate to interrupt, but it's closing time, Dennis said. Already, I answered. What time do you close? Monday to Friday, he answered. My God, one o'clock in the morning, I exclaimed. Actually, closer to three. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your fun, Dennis smiled. I couldn't believe what time it was. 
I had to get up in five hours, and I was still buzzing from the wine. It was definitely time for me to leave. Dennis tried not to give us time to pay and say goodbye. I paid cash, leaving Dennis a good tip, while Terrence paid with a credit card and had to wait for Dennis to return. I had such a fun night and didn't want it to end awkwardly, so I decided I had to leave now. I jumped off the stool and tripped when I landed. Terrence grabbed my hand and held me until I regained my balance. When standing is an obstacle, you realize you've had too much to drink, I said, trying to hide my embarrassment with bad humor. This is true. I hope they don't drag you from here to the elevator, he replied. So why am I so drunk and you so sober? We drank the same amount. I asked, counting the number of empty glasses between use, probably because you drank wine and I drank ice water. What? So you've been drinking ice water all this time? So I was essentially drinking alone? Of course it looks like it, but if it makes you feel better, I still had fun. I'm just not a big drinker, he explained. I felt like a fool. I feel like a fool, I asked, blushing. Don't be so hard on yourself. You're a friendly drunk. He laughed. I joined in his laughter, but it was more out of embarrassment than anything else. We exchanged good night wishes and wished each other good luck during tomorrow's seminar. It will be easier for you, Merman, I said before walking away and heading back to my room. I remembered the night in the shower and touched my hand, still feeling the warmth of his grip as he held on. It had been a long time since I had been touched, and even his simple grip was soothing and soothing. Sad, I know. And just when I thought I couldn't feel pathetic anymore, I remembered the waitress. What happened to me and the waitress? Why did I feel so relieved that she wasn't there? Was I really so insecure that I felt that a young pretty girl would hurt my chances with Terrence? Damn it, I did just that. I'm not proud of how I felt. She was just so damn beautiful and I was so damn insecure. And as selfish as it may sound, I wanted Terrence to have eyes only for me. The next morning, I woke up groggy and incredibly thirsty. The wine the night before had taken its toll on me a little, but nothing could keep me away from Terrence, I mean, the seminar. I made it to the hotel banquet hall, grabbed a cupcake and made my way through the crowd, sneakily looking for Terrence. I tried my best not to make eye contact with the other sellers, Otherwise, I would risk them coming up to me and asking for what they were selling. It wasn't easy. Everyone seemed to be looking at each other, so it was difficult to look anywhere without making eye contact with another sales representative. The risk suddenly became too great, so I decided to look at the picture on the wall and patiently waited for class to begin. My first class of the day was called Selling Yourself. I sat in the back of the room with a pen and paper in my hand ready to take notes that I knew I would throw away immediately after it was all over. The room was filled with about a hundred people, sitting on folding chairs and exchanging business cards with anyone in a cheap suit. I searched the room one last time, hoping that I would see Terrence, but he wasn't there, which is not really surprising. At the same time, five more classes were taking place in other rooms. He could have been in any of them. I cursed myself for not asking him which class he would go to first. I made myself comfortable and prepared for a very long and boring two-hour class. It's good that I was sitting by the door. This makes it easy to escape. I lowered my head and began to draw in my notebook when I heard the instructor's voice. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Selling Yourself. My name is Terrence Sanderson, and I will be your instructor. I raised my head and couldn't believe my eyes. Here he is on stage giving a lecture. Continuing to speak, he looked around the room and hesitated slightly when he met my gaze. I shook my head in disbelief and smiled at him. He smiled back and continued. I wish I could say I learned a lot from his course, but the truth is, I didn't listen. I just admired his movements on stage. He walked from one end of the stage to the other and all eyes followed him. He spoke as much with his hands as with his mouth, making corny jokes throughout the presentation. The crowd loved him and everyone stayed in their seats throughout his entire set. I was immediately drawn to him, his movements, his mannerisms, his ability to hold the attention of the class. He looked even better today than he did last night, if that was even possible. He was wearing a charcoal gray suit with a burgundy shirt underneath with the top two buttons undone. He looked relaxed and professional, even without a tie. 
There was a moment during his presentation when he took off his jacket, revealing a little more definition in his arms and chest, and I wished I had sat closer. During the lecture, our eyes met many times, and I smiled at him every time. One day when he looked at me, I just stuck my tongue out, and he chuckled quietly mid-sentence. I liked him. I really liked him. I think he felt the same way, or at least I hoped he did. Maybe this is just what I needed. I remembered what my therapist said. Karen, you should do what makes you feel better. Honestly, I can't think of a better way to make myself feel better than to be with Terrence. Besides, I'm sure Daniel was with other people and wasn't just sitting around moping all day. The more I thought about it, the more sense it made. I have the opportunity to be with a great guy who I'm attracted to and feel comfortable with, which in itself is a rarity. Should I be so blind as to ignore it? Or should I grab this chance and make myself feel incredibly good? The answer was obvious. I had waited long enough and from now on, I was going to put my needs first. Before I knew it, the lesson was over and everyone was applauding. He looked at me one last time and I muttered the words, Good job, merman! As I continued to applaud. He smiled and nodded approvingly. I took a few other classes that day, but it was nowhere near as interesting as his. In fact, they were so boring that I surfaced halfway through each of them and had a snack at the same time, in case you didn't know. After all the classes were finished, I waited for Terrence outside his classroom door. I waited and waited, but still there was no sign of him. When I entered the classroom, it was completely empty. I must have missed him. Curse. I didn't know what room he was in, not that it mattered. I didn't want to scare him by just showing up at his door, so I decided I'd go back to the bar tonight in hopes of catching him there. I went up to my room, took a shower, texted the kids, and checked my email. I didn't even notice how the phone in the hotel room was blinking, letting me know that a message was waiting for me. I checked the message and was excited to hear Terrence's voice. Water and wine at eight today? Hope to see you there. By the time I got the text, it was already 7.30 so I quickly threw on my dress, put on my makeup, and headed out the door, all the while thinking, tonight? I couldn't wait. When I got to the bar, it was actually packed. There were no empty seats. Stupid conference. I searched the room and found Terrence at the dining room table. Seeing me, he waved his hand, inviting me to join him. We hugged each other tenderly and sat down. The nice young waitress from last night came and took our order. I'm just lucky. She didn't recognize me and quickly took our order. Terrence didn't pay any attention to her and was completely focused on me. I watched his eyes carefully, and he didn't even look at her as she left. I somehow felt relieved. He clearly wasn't like most guys. Even Daniel would have made it to the top. Damn me, too. We ordered a bottle of wine and some appetizers to share. You know, could you tell me that you were one of the instructors? I said. What fun would that be? He grinned. Oh, right. I forgot. You live to embarrass me, right? You do all this yourself. I just appreciate it. We both laughed and he filled our glasses. When the food arrived, we ate from each other's plates like a couple. We talked about the seminar and I told him how much everyone enjoyed his talk. Is it true? He asked. What did you like most? When you took off your jacket, I winked. Oh, so I was just eye candy? In a way, yes. I saw him blush and he shook his head in mock disgust. We continued to eat and teased each other throughout the meal. He was amazingly funny, and the more I laughed, the more comfortable I felt around him. I couldn't believe I was here flirting with a guy. When was the last time I did this? It was nice. My feelings were mutual, and I knew there was something between us. Tonight is night, my mind repeated. We finished our meal and drank our last glass of wine. Have you ever been to Chicago? He asked. No, this is my first time. Actually, my plan was to skip the seminars and go sightseeing, I replied. What happened? I met some guy at a bar. Lucky, he said. Not yet, I teased. He laughed. You know, I have another presentation to do in the morning if you want to skip class. Maybe we can go see some sights together. I'd love to. I said. It was about 10 o'clock at night when the waitress came and gave us the receipt in one of those leather booklets. He paid for it in cash and we finished the wine. Thank you for dinner, 
but I didn't have to pay, I said. No problem. It was a pleasure. You know, the night is still young. Would you like to explore the city a little? He asked. Actually, I'm pretty tired. It's been a long day, I said. Maybe we should just go to bed. I emphasized the word, us. Sounds like a good plan, he smiled. He took my hand as we rode up the elevator. We were silent from excitement. Neither of us uttered a word. Tonight is that very moment, the thought began to run through my head. We both had huge smiles on our faces, and we were both super excited. I could feel everything below my waist, tingling with anticipation. This evening will definitely be significant. I was so excited that I mustered all my strength not to rush at him right in the elevator. We walked to the door of his room and went inside, and as soon as he closed the door, I pulled him close and kissed him on the lips. He put his arm around my waist, and I wrapped my arms around his neck. I parted my lips as his mouth moved closer to mine, and I felt a warmth throughout my body when our lips met. He was so much taller than me that I had to tilt my head back as we began to kiss deeper. His hands slid down my side and cupped my buttocks as he began kissing my neck. I held his chest, letting his body dominate mine. I felt his excitement and his hands began to lift my dress. At that moment I thought about Daniel, about the children, about how I had failed as a wife. I thought about what I was doing now and how it could jeopardize everything I had achieved. I felt ashamed. I was scared. Suddenly all my insecurities seemed to come crashing down on me. What if I'm not great in bed? What if he doesn't like it with me? Do I actually know what I'm doing? What if I can't satisfy him? It's amazing how your own thoughts can ruin a perfectly good moment. I felt his hands squeeze my bare butt and I pushed him away. Sorry, I can't, I said. Why? What happened? He asked in surprise. Nothing, just too early. Okay, it's okay, I understand. I'm not ready for this, I continued to mutter. Cold. I thought I was ready, but I'm not, I continued to mutter. It's okay, he reassured me. It's just too much for me right now. It's okay, Karen, I understand, he repeated. I had to leave, and quickly. I've embarrassed myself again and look like a fool. What an idiot I am. I started frantically looking for my purse and couldn't breathe. Panic grew and I felt tears welling up in my eyes. Where's my purse? I looked around, avoiding his gaze. It's right here. He took my purse, which was right behind me, and handed it to me. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, I said again. It's okay, honestly. I understand. I can't explain, it's just... It's okay, Karen. You don't need to explain. I understand. Honestly, he said comfortingly. I opened the door, and just as I was about to rush towards the elevator, he grabbed my hand. Are we still planning on sightseeing tomorrow? He asked. What? Didn't you hear what I said? I'm not ready. I don't talk about it, he said, pointing around the room. I'm talking about really getting out and seeing the sights. Nothing more, he explained. Um, okay, okay, it will be fine, I said, not because I wanted to, but because I would agree to anything to leave. Meet me in the hall at noon then? Okay, see you later, I said and ran to the elevator. Good night, Karen, he said, waving at my door. Yeah, I said, and let the elevator swallow me whole. When I returned to my room, I immediately fell on the bed and cried. I cursed myself for being such an idiot, for being such a neurotic, but most of all, I cursed Daniel for putting me in this situation. Why did you do this to me, Daniel? Why? Look what you did to me. I didn't want this in my life. I wanted everything to go back to where it was. I felt as if I was starting to go semi-hysterical. I didn't have the strength to fight, so I decided to just give her freedom. I ended up crying and falling asleep, waking up still wearing the dress I had worn the night before. I felt better and calmer. I knew it wouldn't be easy and now I believed it more than ever. It's not that I didn't want Terrence, I really did. I just wasn't ready. I just wanted it so bad that I didn't even think about whether I could handle it. I tried to force myself and paid a high price. I can't blame Terrence. He was very understanding. He never asked questions, never tried to push me. He was a real gentleman and acted like he really understood. I never told him anything about my life other than where I work and what I do but he acted like he knew exactly what I was going through and gave me all the space I needed. I wonder what he thinks of me now. He probably thinks I'm so spoiled that I should take medication. 
Unfortunately, he's probably right. I'm sure I scared him, and he probably doesn't want anything to do with me. I can't blame him, but he still invited me to go sightseeing today. Why? Was this just a weak attempt to make me believe that he really understood everything? Or was it just so he wouldn't blame himself if I jump it off the balcony? I really didn't want to see him anymore. I couldn't face him after that psychotic episode. But the truth is that I really enjoyed being with him. My little outburst, the other night aside, we got along really well and had fun together. Should I throw away a potentially great friendship just because of a little fit? I think it's up to him to decide. I was planning to meet him. For that matter, at least apologize again for your behavior. I didn't go to any seminars in the morning. I didn't want to. I had a lot on my mind and just stayed in my room until it was time to meet Terrence. I hope he will be there. I pulled on jeans and a light sweater in preparation for a chilly day of sightseeing. I came into the hall at noon, and he was gone. I can't say that I was completely happy. Ivlena. I decided to sit down and wait for him for a few more minutes. Fifteen minutes later, he arrived. He apologized for being late, explaining that students had questions after class. I'm glad you're here, he said. Honestly, I didn't think you'd come. There are two of us, I smiled. Come on, let's explore, he said, taking my hand and pulling me through the door. We walked around the city, soaking up the energy of its people and the mix of old and new buildings. We visited Buckingham Fountain, walked along the pier, through Millennium Park, and enjoyed great views of the city from the Willis Tower sky deck. All this time we talked about our personal lives, about children, spouses, and family life. I told him what was going on with my husband and he said he knew what it was like to start all over again. He has two children and has been divorced for over a year. At first he was just as shy, withdrawn, and afraid. He really didn't like it. He missed the comfort of family life and the security it gave. But he said that over time it gets easier and you begin to value yourself more than before and have a better understanding of what you had and what you want. At first he missed it all the time, but looking back, he realized that the marriage was not so ideal. Now he looks only forward without looking back. He knew exactly what I was going through and I appreciated him even more for it. He was so easy to talk to and his company was a real refreshment. I realized that this is what I was missing in my life. Not sex, but camaraderie. Just two people talking about life, surrounded by enough distractions to keep the conversation light. I felt great being with Terence, and without the possibility of sex I could be myself and enjoy the company of another person. When we finally got tired of walking around, we went to a bar and danced the night away. By the end of the evening, we were exhausted and took a taxi back to the hotel. We were still smiling and laughing on the way there and in the elevator. We pressed the buttons for our floors and realized the fun was ending. There was a sad silence between us, knowing that this was our last night and that we both needed to return to our separate lives. Karen, listen, I just want to thank you for the great time. You don't need to thank me. I feel better after spending time with you. You gave me exactly what I needed at the right time. I will be forever grateful to you, I said. You are unique, Karen. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. The elevator doors opened and he kissed my cheek before exiting and heading to his room. I raised my hand as if to say wait, but lowered it, thinking it was better not to. As soon as the elevator doors closed, I felt tears welling up in my eyes as I held back my tears. I had his business card and figured we could keep in touch that way, but how long would that last? Perhaps it's best to end this before it starts. When I returned to my room, I undressed and jumped into the shower. My body was tired, but my mind was busy thinking about Terrence. I tried I could get it out of my head, but I just couldn't. I wrapped myself in towels, sat on the bed, and checked my email. To my surprise, I had a message from Daniel. Karen, I'm so sorry for the way I behaved. I was wrong. When you get back, call me. Let's have dinner and try to forget about everything. I want to start over with you, make everything right. I love you and miss you so much. Daniel, I have been waiting for such a message for a long time. I even dream it about it. In fact, just a few days ago, I would have been happy and overwhelmed with joy that Daniel was coming back. But strangely, I wasn't. I mean, I love Daniel, but I was thinking about Terrence. 
I put my fingers on the keyboard for what felt like hours, trying to figure out what to say to him, trying to figure out what I really want from our marriage, what I really need. I finally gave up and closed my laptop. I lay down on the bed, staring at the ceiling, feeling more confused than ever. I didn't know what to do, but I quickly thought of someone who had experienced something similar who might know the answer. The only way to find out. I quickly dried myself off and threw on the same dress I was wearing last night and ran out the door. I knew it was a weak excuse to see Terrence, but it was still an excuse, right? As I approached his door, I looked around to make sure no one was watching. I don't know why I did it. I just did it. I knocked softly on his door, not wanting to disturb the neighbors, but no one answered. I knocked a little louder and waited, but still no answer. I raised my hand, ready to rush inside, but stopped myself. I figured he was probably fast asleep by now, and I really shouldn't have been here considering my motives weren't sincere. I turned to leave when the door opened. Terrence stood behind the door with his head looking out. Sorry, I said. I woke you up? No, not at all. I just got out of the shower. Is everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine. I just wanted to say goodnight. Oh, okay. Do you want to come in? He asked, holding out his hand. I looked at both ends of the corridor, making sure that no one was nearby. Again, I don't know why I did it. I just did it, and then put my hand in his. He led me through his door and locked it behind us. He was naked, except for a towel wrapped around his waist, and his body was still slightly damp from the shower. He sat on his bed, putting on a t-shirt, and waited for me to speak. I looked around the room, thinking about how similar it was to mine. It had a queen-sized bed with a flat-screen TV in front of it and a table and chair to the side. The closet was directly opposite the bathroom and had a full-length mirror attached to the door. Okay, I admit. I wasn't looking around so much as I was stalling for time. Sorry for the mess. I wasn't expecting guests, he said. I have to go, I asked. Of course not. You look like you want to say something. Something important, perhaps? What is it? What I wanted to tell him and what I wanted to do to him were two completely opposite things. Nothing important, really. I just... I really wanted to say goodnight and that I'll miss you. I like your hair like this. He smiled. What's wrong with my hair? I answered. I turned to the mirror and began to smooth my hair. In my haste to get down here, I completely forgot to comb my hair. Terrence came up behind me and put his arm around my waist. We looked at each other in the mirror. It felt so good to be in his arms. You look great, he said. I smiled in gratitude, and he gently kissed the side of my neck. I held his hands tightly, feeling my body trembling with pleasure. He kept kissing my neck and lightly biting my shoulders. His hands slid over my stomach and then onto my chest. I leaned my head back onto his chest and took a deep breath, never taking my eyes off the mirror. He placed his hands on my shoulders and pulled both of my straps down at the same time, causing my dress to fall to the floor. He put his arm around my waist again and held me tightly as we looked at each other in the mirror. Normally, I would be embarrassed to be completely naked in front of someone, but with him, I felt completely at ease. He took off his T-shirt and pressed his bare chest against my back. The warmth of his body sent shivers down my arms. We looked great together. His height and athletic build complemented my curves perfectly. We really looked great together. He continued to kiss my neck while his hands slid over my stomach and up to my breasts. Just watching his hands massage my breasts in the mirror turned me on beyond belief. We both looked in the mirror, admiring how his hands caressed my breasts. I let out a soft moan as he turned me a little, leaned down and started kissing one of my breasts. I wrapped one arm around his neck and continued to run my fingers through his hair with the other. I bit my lip as I watched his hand slowly slide down my body to the top of my thighs until it was between my legs. I let out a quiet sob. He left his hand in place, motionless, and continued to kiss my side, my waist, and down to my butt. He knelt down in front of me, turned me a little, and continued to kiss my stomach. 
I watched as his hands slowly moved from the back of my calves up the back of my thighs until they were resting perfectly on my buttocks. He continued to run his tongue over my stomach and then turned me completely so that my back was facing him and began kissing my way down my lower back to my buttocks. I started kissing his chest, running my fingers over his stomach. I removed his towel, revealing his private part, admiring its length and thickness. I knelt down, closed my eyes, and began to work. Then he gently laid me on the bed and lay down next to me. He grabbed a blanket and covered us with it. We remained face to face, kissing passionately, pressing our bodies tightly against each other. Our hands were under the blanket, exploring and massaging freely and without restrictions. We stayed like this for about 20 minutes, slowly arousing our senses and increasing our desire. Being under the covers, I felt cozy, but cheeky. It was romantic and erotic at the same time, the most sensual feeling I have ever experienced. After sex, he held me tightly and warmly as we exchanged soft kisses, knowing it wouldn't be long before we found ourselves in the embrace of passion again. I stayed in Terence's bed for the rest of the night and woke up in his arms. I couldn't remember the last time I had several such exciting days. This was exactly what I needed and wanted. I was completely satisfied and felt good. I felt like a new person. A confident, strong, and optimistic person, not just an empty shell. Terence and I said goodbye at the airport. It wasn't easy for either of us, and all we could do was promise to keep in touch. Terence was an amazing friend and a fantastic lover, and the memories of the last few days may have been the best I've ever had, but I knew what I had to do, or at least try to do. I decided to give Daniel another chance. We'll go to dinner and talk about our future and try to work on our marriage for the sake of the kids. I made a commitment to Daniel and I was going to keep it, but now I'm no longer afraid of being alone, no longer afraid of losing him. I am unique, and I won't let anyone tell me otherwise. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.